Hello everyone, this is the Court of Diesel here, and welcome to Season 7 of Thomas and Friends Reviewed. Wow, can you believe it? You guys didn't have to wait for two years or so for another Thomas and Friends video. But yes, we're right here, the final season of the classic era. A season that I remembered as a little kid, but this is the season that was the end of a lot of things before Thomas went into some changes. Changes we'll get into later. But now, it's time to take a look and see if Season 7 was a good season to end off the classic era of Thomas. And I'll be helping you. Oh, hey Toy Bonnie, welcome back to my channel. You did tell me that Season 7 is your favorite season from the show, so I guess it's fair you can help out, seeing as how you helped me with my favorite season, Season 5. Oh, absolutely. Season 7 was the first season I remember watching as a little kid when I got the Hooray for Thomas and Other Adventures DVD, and I remember adoring the episodes that were on that DVD. Plus, I kind of felt that I didn't do such a great job reviewing Season 5 with you, so I feel this season review will be the perfect way to make up for my poor reviewing style I did back then. Well, I didn't think you did that bad of a job. We're all noobs when starting something new. But hey, we do a good job reviewing together, so why not do a second round of a Thomas review with just us two? Thanks, man. I'd love to do a second round of 26 fresh Thomas episodes for me to review with ya. Plus, we're talking about my favorite season, so this video should be a lot of fun to do. Alright, so let's get started. And since you and the fans will how me for getting even the littlest of facts wrong, why don't you start with the trivia for this season, as there's a lot to unpack with Season 7. Of course! Well, Season 7, like you said at the beginning, was the last season for a lot of things. It was the last season to be shot using 35mm film cameras, it was the last season to use the 4.5 minute time slot, this was the last season to have characters committed to Erdl before the range was discontinued in 2004, this was the last season to have Phil Fairley as producer, the last season to have Michael Donald and Julian Campbell as composers for the show, the last season that was made by Ghislaine Entertainment, the last season where Brit Alcroft was involved in the production, the last season to use the original Thomas theme song, and this was the last season to have David Minnan as director for the show. Alright, but is that really all? The season also introduced some new things that the show would later carry on, right? Well, as for the things this season introduced, this was the first season that was co-produced by Hit Entertainment, who will officially start producing the show starting from the next season. This is also the first season to introduce the show's current logo, which went from Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends to Thomas and Friends. Now, this is exclusive for this season, but to my knowledge, this is the only season with different soundtracks for each region, with the UK and other countries having the original Mike and Junior soundtrack, while the US had new music composed by the series' then new composer, Robert Harshorn. That's it pretty much, this season only introduced two new things. Hmm, well that's not all the series introduced this. This is also the first season to introduce a new narrator for the US, Michael Brandon. So, just like always, we'll be reviewing both the US and UK narrators for this review from the season all the way to season 17, and we can tell this will be interesting. But enough talk for now, let's get started. Episode 157, Emily's New Coaches. Emily takes Annie and Clarabelle to practice her new route, but when Thomas and his friends notice, they get cross at her. Alright, we're starting off season 7 with a poor start. I don't really like this episode. This episode has so many problems that I'll try to keep it simple. First off, Emily has no coaches to practice with, and everyone getting cross at her is totally unnecessary, especially Edward, which boy oh boy, thank goodness this isn't that episode with him, but we'll get to it. Oh man, we'll get to it. Another problem I have is that Thomas thinks the coaches are for him, which I call bullshit because her Tom and Hat said nothing like that, and it irks me a lot. Does the title say Thomas' new coaches? No! The title makes it clear that those coaches he's pulling are gonna be for Emily. Oh, and also, I think Oliver shouldn't be in this episode. I would've replaced him with Toby because unlike him, Oliver doesn't know Thomas very well. Now, you may think we're starting up with a fail-way episode, but no, I give this episode a middle-of-the-road weak rating. Even though the episode's problems irritate me a lot, I still love the camera work, the theme Mike and Junior came up for Emily, and I also think this episode is an excellent introduction to the real Emily before she was utterly destroyed in the next season. Yeah, I agree with Toy Bonnie. This episode has a lot of problems that he just listed. I can understand both Thomas and Percy being crossed with Emily. Thomas because he does love his coaches, and he does get jealous when someone else tries to take them, so I can understand him being crossed. And Percy is his best friend, so I could also understand him being cross as well. But everyone sure is quick to jump on Emily. 
Really? No one tried to be friendly with her or ask her why she has Thomas's coaches? I will say, though, this episode is a nice introduction to Emily. Now, whether changing her character trait completely from Season 8 onward was a good thing or a bad thing, we'll get to that in a bit later. I will also say, though, that watching this episode, I forgot how beautiful her theme is for the UK version. It's very nice, and I love the shots the team got for this episode. It is a step above from Season 6. And the scene where Thomas and Oliver were about to crash into each other was a good build-up with good shots and editing. But I'm also sad to say that even with these good parts, this episode will also get a 5 out of 10, a meh episode for me. Episode 158, Percy Gets It Right. Percy tries to warn the others about Toby's line being wobbly. This is a step up after the last episode. I like the visuals and the directing this episode offers. And it's nice to see Percy being brave and being right once in a while. I also like the metrics on making sure to at least take someone a bit seriously when they think something is wrong or something is dangerous. And even if they're wrong, it's good to always be cautious just to be sure. This is one episode where I prefer the US soundtrack over the UK. I just love the little piece they made when Percy is set out to rescue Thomas. Anyway, as the second episode for this season, I give it an 8 out of 10 for a good episode. I agree. I think this is a great episode. We get to see Percy shine once again in his very own episode. And I really like the message this episode gives us, which is to always listen to warnings and advice every time you're gonna go out. I can relate to that now that we're in pandemic times. I also really love the visuals this episode gave us. And the scene where Thomas crashed into the dirt was really well made. Now in terms of the soundtrack, I'm gonna have to disagree with Sakoa. I prefer the UK soundtrack over the US one, simply because I'm so used to hearing Mike and Junior soundtrack on this episode. So with all that said, I think this is definitely a good episode and a huge improvement over the last episode. Episode 159, Bill, Ben and Fergus. Fergus is sent to work at the quarry with Bill, Ben and Mavis. This was another good episode. I love the idea of pairing Bill and Ben with Fergus, and I also really loved when they got really annoyed at his do it right attitude. Bill and Ben alone saved this episode from being a weak episode, because unlike past episodes, here they have a good reason to be naughty. By the way, I find the part where Bill and Ben shove into the unsafe side to be quite funny. Now Fergus, I think it's a good character and all, but his do it right catchphrase can get very annoying quickly in this episode. But that's only a minor complaint and it doesn't really affect this being called a good episode for me. I think this is a fine episode but it's not one of my favorites. I agree in that it's nice to see Bill and Ben doing their usual tricks and being naughty. Also, I feel like Thomas has mentioned about Bill and Ben is another nod to the Railway series, because Thomas has never met Bill or Ben in the TV series before, unless we want to count the special letter episode. I also like how they filmed the rock slide scene. Again, a nice build-up with some good directing and camera shots they got. But the one thing that I didn't enjoy about the episode is Fergus himself. Now as a model, I like it. I think it looks cool, and I also find the trivia with his model to be interesting. Apparently this was the episode that damaged the model during filming, and that's why we don't see him anymore in the show. But his whole do it right stick is really annoying. You ever had that teacher or someone coming up to you saying you failed a certain project or a test, and they tell you to do better, but they don't even bother telling you what you did wrong and that you're supposed to know what you did was wrong? That's basically his character in a nutshell. Now there were some moments like the blasting scene where he does explain a little bit on why it's wrong to do this and that, but he doesn't give any specific details on how to do it right in the first place. So how are they going to do it right if you don't tell them? Now I had to think long and hard about the rating. Honestly, if the rock slide scene or Bill and Ben being in character wasn't in this episode, I would have given it a met rating. Honestly, it's still close on a met rating, but I'll give it a 6 out of 10 for a light, good episode. Episode 160, The Old Bridge. Scarloe is afraid to cross the bridge after he almost died from it. I'm going to come out and say this. I think this episode gets overhated and I feel it's underrated. Now let me explain. Sure, we could debate if Scarloe is completely out of character, but I feel he was justified for his fears. He almost died trying to cross the bridge and sure, it's safe now, it's so safe that there's no railings on the bridge. I'm sure he won't derail himself and fall into the water. And do you see how high it is down below? I would be scared to cross the bridge myself if I almost died. Now, if Scarloe would have left Reneus to rot, then yes, I would say he's completely out of character. 
But this episode does a good job showing how fears can start and develop, and it takes time for certain people to face them. Now, Toy Bonnie and I were discussing this, but I will admit, the way Sir Topham Hat was used in this episode can rub some people off. It's not a good idea to apply pressure on the someone, especially when they had a near-death experience, to face their fears so quickly. But I also think what this episode was trying to get at is that you need to face your fears sooner or later, and there'll always be someone there to help you face them. If he wants to explain this part on this review, he can, because we also talked about how this episode could have been handled a little better. But overall, I feel this episode gets too much hate. It's got a good plot and a good message, really nice shots and music for the UK version. So I'm going to give this episode a 7 out of 10 for a good episode. Now if you still feel this episode is weak or bad, then that's fine. Again, don't take these reviews too seriously, but still give this episode another shot and see if you agree or disagree with me. I would love to hear what you guys think about this episode, like Toy Bonnie. Well, for the longest time, I was considering giving this episode a failway rating, due to Scarloway being so out of character and the episode being a bit too boring. But after watching this episode for a total of three times, I think I was oversaturating a bit. Because now I get some parts of this episode, like why Scarloe doesn't want to cross the bridge, because the way he almost fell off the bridge was pretty horrifying. Honestly, if that would have happened to me in real life, I wouldn't even dared to cross that bridge for the rest of my life. Speaking about Sir Top and Hat, I don't think it's a good idea to apply pressure on someone to face their fears, especially after having a near-death experience as Sakoa already mentioned. From my point of view, applying pressure will only make the person go even further away from the thing that started their fear in the first place. Anyway, enough of that. There were quite a few things I liked about this episode. I liked the music in the episode, and I also really liked the scene of Scarloe rescuing Reneas from the bridge. I think it was a good way for him to finally face his fear. Now, coming up with the rating for this episode was really tough, but the good news is that now I don't think this is a failaway episode. But at the same time, there's not enough material for me to call this a good episode. So after thinking about it long and hard, I'm gonna give this episode a middle of the road weak rating. Episode 161, Edward's Brass Band. Edward is unable to take the brass band after having an accident at the docks. I love this episode. This was one of my favorite episodes when I was a little kid. And to this day, I always come back to this episode because Edward's role in this episode is just fantastic. Yes, you can argue that he might be a little bit out of character after Sir Tubman Hat tells him that he can't take the brass band after his accident. But to me, he's still the same Edward we know and love. I also really enjoyed seeing Birdie get stuck in the mud, and I really liked the way the storm was executed well in this episode. I really don't have that much to say, so this is yet another good episode. I don't have much to say about this episode either, but it is a good episode. I like the colors, the directing, and the story. It's a simple story. Fun fact, in the UK version, the brass band used Morse code to call for help. Anyway, I don't have too much to say about this episode, like I said, so I'll give it a 7 out of 10 for a good episode. Episode 162, What's the matter with Henry? Thomas and Percy thinks Henry is faking being sick, and they make him take a heavy train of coal trucks. This is a good episode right here. This episode does a good job of training people getting sick, and how others, whether it's yourself or someone else, wondering if you really are sick or if you're just faking it. I do understand where people are coming from when they say Thomas and Percy are out of character. I can understand with Percy because he does have great respect for Henry, but let's not forget that they're still cheeky engines. I mean, this is the same Thomas that didn't think Henry was sick before, and I believe his exact words were like, you're too fat, you need exercise in order to feel better. So I can believe that he didn't believe Henry was still sick in this episode as well. Sadly, that's how it also happens in real life. Someone in your friends or family group would think that you're just faking it, and they'll make you do some sort of activities to prove that you're not sick. Heck, people do that to themselves as well, and it could really be damaging to them if they don't acknowledge that they are sick. Emily's role was also great in this episode. It was very sweet of her to be concerned with Henry's health, and she felt it was necessary to tell Sir Topham Hatt about it. It takes just one person to speak up, and they can actually save another person's life before it gets even worse. Plus, Thomas and Percy did feel so bad when they realized that Henry was actually sick. Again, if you feel they were out of character, then I understand where you're coming from. But as for me, this episode does a really great job portraying on how sick people get treated, and how it should be handled. I also love the UK soundtrack for this episode. 
I love how they also portray what's going on with Henry, like you're also worried about him too. And I love the remakes they did for his theme. So yep, if it wasn't obvious, I'm giving this episode an 8 out of 10 for a good episode. I agree. I think this is a really good episode. From my perspective, I see Thomas and Percy as two little kids who just think that their friend, in this case being Henry, is pretending to be sick and they do a great job in portraying it. I also really like Emily's role in this episode. They portray her as a very concerned person that cares about Henry's health. And it really shows how Emily's character truly is. It's a shame her character really disappeared after this season. But for now, I really like Emily in this season. Now, do I forgive Thomas and Percy in this episode? Well, I would say yes, because they didn't really think he was really sick, and it wasn't until he was brought in by Emily that they realized they had made a big mistake, so I accept their apology. Anyway, I really don't have anything else to say, so I'm confident to give this episode the medicine of a good episode rating. Episode 163, James and the Queen of Sodor. Gordon tricks James into taking the Queen of Sodor. Man, this was a funny episode. Now, if you've been paying attention to the series, we all know that James is a character that thinks he can get away with anything, and this episode is a great example of that. I love how Gordon tricked James into taking this tug, which is so funny that you have to love it, and I also really like the scene of the barge getting covered in sludge, which makes you think that James is also going to get covered in sludge, but he doesn't, leaving you to think that the episode is going to end with James getting away with being clean. But at the end of the episode, Percy comes back and showers James with quarry dust, and that scene is definitely the ultimate karma for James. I personally found that scene, along with James being furious about taking the tug to the scrapyard, to be extremely funny and quite hilarious too. Serves you right, James. Anyway, with all that said, I give this episode a very good episode rating. I agree with Troy Barney, this is a really funny episode. As Troy Barney mentioned, this episode makes you wonder where is it going? At first you think it will go a certain way. Like you think James would actually get dirty from carrying the barge with the way he's been boasting about staying clean. But no, he's still clean in this episode. You would also think that James would leave after learning that the Queen of Sordor is just a dirty tugboat. But no, he's still got the job done with little to no fuss. This episode gives the viewers a nice surprise with a nice and funny payoff at the end. Both Brandon and Angelus also help play the comedy for this episode. They do such a good job voicing the engines that makes this episode all the more enjoyable to watch. So, I give this episode a 9 out of 10 for a great episode. Episode 164, The Refreshment Lady's Tea Shop. Peter Sam helps the refreshment lady find a new location for her tea shop. Alright, so it's been over two seasons since we've had a Peter Sam episode. And you guys know that his episodes are usually my favorites. So, how did this episode do? It's also one of my favorite episodes. I like that we get to see the refreshment lady again, and I like how simple this story is. It's a nice and cute episode with a couple of funny lines and moments. Like when the refreshment lady says that finding the new tea shop would be a piece of cake, and how both Peter Sam and Shatop have had a comment on that phrase. The visuals for this episode are also really great. The soundtrack is perfect for the tone and feel for this episode. I can't think of anything bad to say about this episode, so yes. Peter Sam has done it again by me giving this episode a 10 out of 10 for a great episode. I agree. I think this is a fantastic episode. One of my favorites since I was a little kid and it's still one of my favorite episodes of the season overall. Like Sekoa said, the story is simple but the visuals are the true highlight of this episode. I really enjoyed seeing Peter Sam helping the refreshment lady and to me that makes it feel like a sequel episode to Peter Sam and the refreshment lady. But instead of Peter Sam leaving the refreshment lady behind, he helps her find a new place for her shop. I also like that the storm scene adds to the overall story, because once Peter Sam sees the old coach and they put it back on the tracks, he comes up with what I think is the most brilliant story concept ever, turning the coach into a restaurant on the go. And that concept is enough to earn this episode an extremely high good rating. As Peter Sam said, I told you it would be a piece of cake. Episode 165, The Spotless Record. Thomas plays a trick on a new engine called Arthur, which makes him lose a spotless record after an accident. I like this episode, it's Thomas being cheeky at its best. I love the little trick he played on Arthur, which leads you to believe that he's gonna have an accident, and in the end, it eventually happens, and it costs him a spotless record. I love the crash, and the look on the squash fruit was very nice. So without any hesitation, I have no doubt in saying that this is a good episode. I don't have too much to say on this episode either. 
I do understand why some might have a problem with Thomas's trick, but it's not like he meant for Arthur to have an accident in the first place, and he did take the blame for it when it did happen. I also like the runaway as well, and the crash scene too. It was nicely filmed and edited. So, like I said, I don't have too much to say on the episode, but I will give it an 8 out of 10 for a good episode. Episode 166, Toby's Windmill. Toby helps the Miller build a new windmill. This was a good episode. You can really tell that Season 7 has a low budget with the amount of stock footage in this episode. But even so, the camera work and the editing for this episode is really good. The story is a nice story too, and again, a simple one. It's also rare to see Toby having his first crash scene, but it was nicely filmed. I don't have too much to say on the episode, but I'll give it a 7 out of 10 for a good episode. I agree, this was a great episode. I love the look of the old windmill, and the storm scene was a really nice addition to the story. In fact, this is the third time that a storm helps advance the story, and this won't be the last time we see a storm help advance the story. I also like Toby helping out his friend, the Miller, which shows that Toby has a soft spot for things he loves seeing. And that's really about it, so I'm gonna go ahead and give this episode a very good episode rating. Episode 167, Bad Day at Castle Lock. Donald and Douglas get stuck on their way to Lord Callan's castle. And this was okay. We've seen these types of episodes before, most notably in seasons 2, 3, and 5. So seeing this type of episode yet again for me is kind of predictable because I just don't like the way they executed the monster in this episode. I can tell from the beginning of the monster scene that it's Harvey with the breakdown train because I can see both Harvey's crane arm and the breakdown crane's arm in the distance. It would have been better if they made Harvey whistle from a far away distance and the twins could have gotten scared. I would have liked to see that, but no, they don't. So what rating am I going to give this episode? Well, like I said, I don't like the way they executed the monster plot, but without counting that predictable scene, the episode does have some nice backpipe music to go along with the visuals, so after thinking about it, I'm going to give this episode a very light good episode rating. Yeah, I'm in the same boat as Toy Bonnie. The story is okay, it's simple to follow. I also like the visuals, and I like the remix that Robert and Wells did for Donald and Douglas. But other than that, it's just a fine episode. Nothing grand, but again, it's simple enough for me to give it a 7 out of 10 for a good episode. Episode 168, Renee's and the Roller Coaster. Renee's has chosen to take the children on a school trip. Well, where to start with this episode? Well, let me start off by saying that I don't actually hate this episode. This was one of the episodes from Season 7 that I would watch a ton of as a kid, and there are some parts that I still enjoy about this episode. But when I started watching it again, and started thinking about it long and hard, I noticed that it has a couple of problems. First, let's get this out of the way. Renee's driver is the worst tour guy ever. He doesn't go into any details on why a certain place is special and important. He's just like, this place is special and important. I'm not going to explain why it's special and important, but it's special and important. Take my word for it. Second, I feel Reneus is out of character in this episode. In some way, I could see what the writers were trying to do, because Reneus has lived on Sword Order along this, and I can understand why he might feel worried about showing the kids what he considers important to him. But still, you would think he would offer his own take or agree with his driver on why certain place is special and important to them. I feel this episode would have been better if it was a Peter Sam episode. I feel Peter Sam would have made more sense on why he feels nervous about making this trip special for the students. Finally, the last nitpick I have is Renee is speeding up. I mean, so much for the tracks being bumpy. But if he knows that the tracks are bumpy, then why is he speeding up in the first place? What, the rusty grease to track up with oil, or was Renee's driver getting bored of the trip too that he wanted to get rid of the children? Anyway, the episode is good in terms of directing and the runaway scene was filmed nicely. I like the soundtrack in both the UK and the US. It's nice to hear the William Tell overtune theme back again, but to be honest, I do kind of prefer the US soundtrack a little bit more in terms of the runaway scene. Overall, while it's not a bad episode, it's another episode where if you don't think about the plot too hard, then it's a fun episode to watch. But thinking about the plot and the amount of problems that it does have, I'm going to give it a 5 out of 10, a meh episode. Again, if you like it, then good for you. I think it is a fun episode by itself, it just has a couple of problems. I agree with some of the points that Koa said, however I disagree with the rating. While yes, we can argue that Renaz is out of character, but to me he isn't. 
I did like him running down the mountain really fast, but those camera effects look so fucking cheesy that I seriously don't believe those hills were that steep. The music is good for both regions, but I'm more nostalgic for the UK version since I've heard it so many times by now. I also really like that we get the William Tell Overture once again. It's a nice touch to the episode in my opinion. So after thinking about it, I think I'll give this episode a middle of the road good rating. This was one of the episodes that got me into Thomas in the first place. And despite the many flaws this episode has, I can not dislike it due to guilty pleasure. So yeah, that's why I give it a good episode rating. Episode 169, Salty Stormy Tale. Salty and Fergus help the lighthouse keeper restore power to the lighthouse. So here we have another episode starring Salty after the last season. And this one is pretty good. I like the concept of Salty helping the lighthouse keeper restore the lighthouse after the generator breaks down. It's such a brilliant idea that I can't say how much I love it. I also adore that storm theme. It's such an iconic theme that in my opinion is Mike O'Donnell and Junior Campbell's best theme to date next to the original Thomas theme. Now with that out of the way, let's talk about a few negatives I have with this episode. First off, we don't need to see Thomas and Percy mocking Salty. That was pointless and a little bit frustrating. Again, I can understand why they're doing it. It's the show's way of portraying them as young kids without making them very childish. But here, they completely mock Salty to the point where it gets really obnoxious and it's so painful to watch. At least on my end. Mocking someone is something that I hate to see. And seeing that being portrayed here does not make it a positive at all. So there goes a few points for this episode. Another negative I have is the title. I hate it. If you're a new viewer who's just getting into Thomas, you would expect the episode to have Thomas and Percy sitting at the docks for the entire episode listening to Salty tell one of his sea stories. But no, that's not the case. Instead, the episode takes fucking forever to get to the actual stormy tale because the beginning drags on for almost the first half of the episode. A perfect title would have been Salty and the Storm or Salty, Fergus and the Lighthouse. So with all that said, what rating should I give this episode? Well, the negatives are really bad, but there are a few strong positive things that stand out a little bit more than the negative stuff, like the look of the storm, and plus the generator exploding makes you feel like you're gonna be involved in a very dangerous situation. So after a lot of thought, I think a very light good rating will do the trick. I do understand where Toy Bonnie and the others are coming from about Thomas and Percy and how they acted, but does it ruin the episode and are they actually out of character? Well, in terms of them being out of character, that's a little hard to say. We do see throughout the series that Thomas and Percy have their favorite engines that they look up to, and sometimes they want to act like their favorite engines, like with Thomas and Gordon, or Percy and some of the big engines that he looks up to. And it's not like they haven't mocked other engines before, or tried to copy them because they look up to them. But I can see where some are coming from if they say that they're a bit out of character, but doesn't ruin the actual episode. No, in my opinion it doesn't. This episode has two good morals going for it. The first being about being careful when mocking someone. Even if you're doing it just for fun and you don't mean to hurt anyone, it doesn't mean it won't actually hurt someone, especially if they're sensitive to begin with. But it also provides with another good message in that you shouldn't jump to conclusions on what others are thinking about you. While Salty does have the right to feel sad about being mocked, it's good to know to ask someone if they can stop or ask why are they mocking you in the first place. As Thomas and Percy didn't mean any harm and there are some people like that in real life. I will also agree that the lightning and camera work for the lighthouse scene was pretty good. And the music alone also helps build a serious tone for that scene. Even if the random shirt and hands kill the mood at the end. But yeah, it's not that big a deal. While not my most favorite episode, this episode does have a good story and message for me to give it a 7 out of 10 for a good episode. Episode 170, Snow Engine. Oliver crashes into a large snowman built by the children. I don't have too much to say on the episode, but I don't hate it either. It's a fine little winter episode, and it's nice to see Oliver again after his absence from the last season. The crash was filmed nicely, and was a creative crash too. The plot is sweet with how the children are happy to see Oliver instead of being sad after he crashed into their snowman. So, yeah, I don't have too much to say on the episode, but I like it enough to give it a 7 out of 10, a good episode. While not my most favorite Oliver episode, I do enjoy it for what it is. I love the look of the crash, and I love how the snowman's head falls out of nowhere. It still brings out a few chuckles out of me. I do agree that the ending with the children making Oliver their snow engine was pretty cute and sweet. It's a nice way to end the episode on a good note. I really don't have that much to say, so I'm giving this a good episode rating. Episode 171, 
something fishy. Arthur discovers the fishing village and later switches places with Thomas after he has an accident. This is a very good episode. Once again, we see more of Arthur's character and it shows that he's pretty affectionate for places he likes to be in. I love how he discovers the fishing village and I also really enjoyed seeing him have the line all to himself at the end. That was very neat. Another thing I liked from the episode was the team bringing back the mention that Thomas hates fish. It's something we haven't seen since season 4's fish. The crash itself was very well made. It's possibly one of my favorite crashes of this season so far. Though I don't know what's with all the cameos in this episode. I mean, Emily makes sense, but why are Murdoch and Spencer here? They haven't even been introduced properly yet. Anyway, that was just a minor complaint and it really doesn't affect this episode for being called a good episode. I agree, this was a pretty good episode. I like how Shatop of Hat just chooses Thomas to run the fishing line, almost as if he's the main character. But I do like that we continue to see Arthur working hard and him having a favorite place that he actually wants to work, which we'll actually see in the next season. Although the only thing I question about the episode is how the troublesome trucks were able to make it past the switch but Thomas wasn't. I know they said that the points were faulty but I'm pretty sure the points don't change like that on their own. But the crash again was creative and overall this was a good episode for me to give it a 7 out of 10, a good episode. Episode 172, The Runaway Elephant. Duncan delivers an elephant to the new park and yeah, how do you think this plot is going to go? Yep, another Duncan episode, and yes, it's pretty much the same thing that we've seen before. Duncan being boastful, and then sooner or later he eats his own words by the end of the episode. Now luckily there were some funny moments in this episode. I do like the ending where Duncan is embarrassed about his accident, and the camera shots and editing for the runaway scene was once again pretty good. I will admit, I do prefer the US soundtrack to this episode, but the UK soundtrack was alright in this episode as well. So, while the episode is a bit of a repeat, I am still going to give it a 7 out of 10 for a good episode. Here we have yet another Duncan episode, but hey, at least this one isn't as boring as another one we're going to see later on in this season. I do actually like this episode. There were a bunch of parts where I got a few chuckles, like Duncan refusing to wait for the brake van, and the part where he completely out of nowhere can't stop. I also really like the ending where they all cheer for Duncan's mistake. And I don't know if some people will agree with me, but I think the statue looks good on the lake. Anyway, I was debating as to whether or not to give this episode a good rating, but since there were a bunch of good moments, I think I can feel comfortable calling this a good episode. Episode 173, Peace and Quiet. Murdoch is a shitty engine who wants peace and quiet because he's an asshole. What the fuck is this bullshit? What were they fucking thinking when they wrote this piece of shit? I don't understand this episode. First Murdoch is angry at Harvey and Salty and calls them chatterboxes, but then because of a flock of sheep he wants to be back with them? I, I just don't fucking get it. Also Murdoch, there is something called a whistle. You could have at least used that to shoo the sheep away from the tracks, but no, you rather wait for Toby to shoo them. Also this line really bothers me. Please stop, groaned Murdoch. I'd rather be back with the chatterbox engines. For what, so you can call them out again after you were rude to them? Fuck you, you fucking moron, and fuck this episode because this is a shitty episode with a shitty plot and a shitty main character. This episode would have been so much better if they zoomed in the camera on the sheep's asshole so we could see the shit coming out of their asses, because that's what this episode is. It's fucking shit. From beginning to end, thank you. Well, um, <laughs> uh, after that little ABGN meltdown, I do agree that this episode could have been so good, but there's so many things that this episode does that falls flat on his face. And honestly, it all has to do with Murdoch himself. Now, I will give him a pass for wanting to go somewhere where it's nice and quiet, as coming from someone that always wanted some peace and quiet myself from noisy and rowdy students I had to deal with during my school year, I get his pain, really, I do. But at the same time, he's asking for the whole island to basically just stop working or don't move just so he can get some peace and quiet. That's just wishful thinking, no matter where you are, buddy. Also, the sheep scene really doesn't make any sense in the context of Murdoch learning his lesson. Really? Noisy sheep makes you want to go back to Harvey and Salty? I mean, if I was in Murdoch's place and the sheep kept pestering me, I would just tell those two to shut up. I think this episode would have worked if Murdoch had some kind of accident in the middle of the countryside and he had to make some noise so he can get saved, and then learn that it's important to make some noise if you need some help. I had to think about this long and hard. The only thing that I did like in this episode was Murdoch's models and visuals, but is it enough to save this episode? 
I'm sorry guys, but I'm giving this episode a 3 out of 10. A bad episode. Again, this episode had the right idea with the story, but sadly it wasn't executed well enough, and there were so many opportunities it could have taken, but like I said, it just falls flat on his face. Episode 174, Fergus Breaks the Rules. Diesel tricks Fergus into thinking that Sir Topham Hatt wants him to work at the smelter's yard. This episode was okay. It wasn't a bad episode, but it was predictable and also a little misleading in terms of the UK title. Fergus never really broke a rule to begin with. He just thought he did when he got tricked by Diesel. Also, why would he believe Diesel to begin with if he knows he's nothing but trouble? Now, to be fair, the plot still would have been the same if he decided not to trust Diesel and stay in the cement works. Then Diesel would have made him worry by saying he broke the rules and Sir Topham Hat will send him away. And then that causes Fergus to be worried and he still ends up running away. While this is not a bad episode, the story is very one note and doesn't have a lot going for it. So as such, I'm going to give it a 5 out of 10, a meh episode. I will say this though, at least this episode gave us a nice catchy song. I agree, this was an okay episode. I found the story to be way too predictable and quite boring in some parts. Also, I don't understand why Fergus believed Diesel's lie if he knows that Diesel is troublesome. That just doesn't make a lick of sense to me. Anyway, the only positives I can think of in this episode were the visuals, Thomas searching for Fergus at nighttime, and Ari and Bert scaring Fergus at the smelters. That really made me laugh so hard. But even with those positives, this doesn't save this episode from being called a weak episode. Lysico has stated, I also don't think this is a bad episode, but the story is just way too predictable that I couldn't call it a good episode. But let's see if the next episode makes up for this and the previous episode. Episode 175, Bulgy writes again. Sir Topham Hatt restores Bulgy to proper working order. So after making cameos throughout the previous season as a hen house, we finally get to see an episode dedicated to Bulgy. I like this episode. It shows Bulgy turning around a new leaf after his evil wrongdoings in season 3. I do like how Sir Topham Hatt decided to give him a second chance to work, and Bulgy's very grateful about it. I also really like the scene where the hens woke up and the inside of Bulgy goes chaos with feathers and broken eggs flying everywhere. I do feel sorry for Bulgy on this one because it wasn't his fault. I love the ending where Bulgy is turned into a vegetable boss. I think it's a really nice ending to Bulgy's story. Though I don't know why his driver put him back on the field with the hands after he had just been restored. I'm sure they could have put him on a bus shed with Birdie or another bus. But those complaints are minor and it really doesn't affect the rating of what is a good episode. Eh, this episode was alright. I do agree that it is nice that Sir Topham had decided to give Bulgy another chance instead of just buying a new engine right away. And I really love the UK version of this soundtrack, especially for the scene where the hens woke up. It does a good job on capturing the passengers and the hens getting scared. And it's also nice to see Bulgy getting another chance and actually improving himself unlike Diesel that just keeps getting sent away whenever he messes up. Now coming up for the rating with this episode was another tough one. It was weird from how Bulgy goes from saying, I don't want to be a vegetable boss to, I'm going to be a vegetable boss now. I felt like that was a little rushed. Plus, it makes me wonder why didn't the driver or passengers notice the hens in the first place before leaving. But after thinking about it, the problems weren't really a deal breaker. Plus, there were a couple of funny moments in this episode, so I'm going to go ahead and give it a 6 out of 10 for a light, good episode. Episode 176, Harold and the Flying Horse. Harold is set to rescue Pegasus before the summer fate starts. This was a really sweet episode. It's nice to get a Harold focus episode and it was just focused on him and no one else. Even though this episode relies on a lot of stock footage, there's still some good camera work and directing and the story was short and simple. I like the model look of Pegasus and a nice little funny moment with Percy when he saw Harold carrying Pegasus. And that's all I have to say on this episode. I don't have too many negatives to say. It's short, it's simple, a sweet episode, so I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10 for a good episode. I agree, this was a great episode. I like that this episode shows us that a boring day can turn into something you don't expect, and that it's always important to stay on guard in case of an emergency. I love the scene where Harold was rescuing Pegasus and carrying him to the fate. I also got a few chuckles when Percy thought horses can fly. Oh boy, silly Percy. I really don't have anything else to say, so I'm giving this amazing episode a good episode rating. Episode 177, The Grand Opening. Scarlowy saves Sir Topman Hat and his wife after the red balloon crashes into a tree. Now this is a really good episode. The visuals for this episode are top notch. I love the view from the red balloon and the shots of it flying through the sky were absolutely beautiful. 
I also love the scene where the balloon begins to fall down and then crashes into a tree. I will admit that got a few chuckles out of me. I have nothing else to say other than well done Scarloe for rescuing Sir Topham and Lady Hat from the balloon and that this is a very very good episode. I agree, this episode was solid. Now yes, it is a repeat of Better Late Than Never, but even so, it's another episode that shows the benefits of being late sometimes. Plus two, it was only Scarloe that was being late because of the extra work he was given. The camera work and soundtrack for this episode was good, and there were a couple of cute moments between Sir Topham Hat and Lady Hat. Also, why did they leave the pilot behind? Where's he supposed to go to now? Anyway, I don't have too much to say on the episode, but it's not too late to give it a 7 out of 10 for a good episode. Episode 178, The Best Dressed Engine. Gordon doesn't want to compete for the Best Dressed Engine competition. This episode was a fun episode. Another simple story involving Gordon, and there's a couple of funny moments with Gordon, especially at the end. The ending was really cute. The Runaway, I guess if you want to call it a runaway, is a good one. Although I think the US soundtrack does a better job capturing the runaway scene in this episode. And yeah, I know Gordon can't see, but that doesn't mean his driver can't see. Should he at least try to stop Gordon before hitting Trevor? Although the filming of the crafts was nicely filmed and edited. I don't have too much to say on the episode. It's a nice simple one, and the Best Dress Engine episode gets an 8 out of 10 for a good episode. I absolutely agree. This was a fun episode. I love everything in this episode. The story, the characters, the visuals, and the runaway with Gordon. This episode, in my opinion, captured the magic of what Thomas is about when I was a little kid. But does that magic still hold up 17 years later in 2021? I can safely say that yes, it absolutely does. Because even watching this episode now as a full grown adult, I still adore this episode from beginning to end. Do I even need to say that this is a good episode? Because it definitely deserves that title. Episode 179, Gordon and Spencer. Gordon meets a new engine called Spencer whom he later rescues on his hill. Here it is, the beginning of a tradition where two engines who think they are both fast appear in an episode together. I absolutely love the pairing of Gordon and Spencer as rivals, even though they're actually cousins, but I'm getting ahead of myself here. I love Spencer, he's possibly one of the best characters to come out of this series as a whole. And while yes, I do think he's an asshole sometimes, I do think he's a very good looking character with a snobby personality that really suits him. I also love the theme Mike and Jr. came up for him, I think it's one of their best character themes ever. Now as for the episode itself, I loved it. Another one of my favorite episodes since I was a little kid, this episode never gets old to watch. I love the little karma Spencer gets when he gets stuck at Gordon's hill. And of course I love the little, who cares line he says to Gordon, that was very funny. So good job Gordon for proving that he's the fastest engine on the island, and with all that said, this is an extremely good episode. This is a pretty good episode. I like the look of Spencer and his character. In some way, he's just like Gordon in that he thinks he's too important to listen to anyone else, but that only ends up getting him into serious trouble. It's no wonder why they have a rivalry between each other. I also love the soundtrack for Spencer both in the US and UK version of this episode, and I think both Brandon and Angelus does a good job of capturing Spencer's arrogance. I don't have too much to say, just another simple episode, but a well-made episode that I'll give it an 8 out of 10 for a good episode. Episode 180, Not So Hasty Pudding. Thomas is set to help Elizabeth after the icy road sends her down into a snowbank. So, at first, I was ready to give this episode a meh episode rating, because I remember not caring for this episode as a kid, because I felt it was a repeat when Thomas first met Elizabeth. But, after watching this episode for this review, the more I thought about it, the more I changed my mind, and now I think this is a good episode. So, let's talk about Thomas and Elizabeth for a second. I do understand how their argument can get annoying to some, as we've seen it before, but I think it works with this episode, and it works with the characters themselves. They are both reliable in some way, but they also have their faults, with Thomas acting like a spoiled brat at times, and with Elizabeth being too blunt and rude. But I like that after Thomas has rescued Elizabeth, he admits that it wasn't her fault, and that he acknowledged that she was trying to be useful. That's actually pretty sweet. I also love the visuals for this episode. The team has done an amazing job making the snowstorm look serious. You know it's no joke. And it's even shown throughout the episode with Elizabeth having trouble trying to stay on the road. You know an accident is about to happen, but you don't know how or when it's going to start. 
So, after thinking and giving it much thought, I'm going to give this episode an 8 out of 10 for a really good episode. Alright, so Lysakoa, I wasn't very fond of this episode at first. I was about to write it off because I really am not a fan of Elizabeth. I just feel she's a rude character at times and that she gets on my nerves very fast. But here, I don't mind her too much, because let's be honest, she isn't on screen that much like on her debut episode the previous season. I also like Thomas's role in this episode. Sure, he brings back the snowplowed issue from season 1, but I do like that he is a bit mature in this episode because he kindly tells Elizabeth that the accident wasn't her fault, and in the end she admits that both of them are reliable. That was pretty cute. Now coming up with the rating for this episode was tough, because on the one hand, I feel this episode is a bit of a repetition of Elizabeth the Vintage Lori, but on the other hand, the team did a very outstanding job on making the sets look like this snowstorm is a very dangerous concern, and I also love getting to see Terence rescuing Elizabeth from the snowbank, so I think a very light good episode rating is fine for this episode. Episode 181, Trusty Rusty. Duncan crosses the old wooden bridge despite Rusty warning him not to use it. Again, it's the same duck and plots we've seen before. An engine warns him not to do something, he ends up doing it anyway, almost has an accident, he's rescued, and he learns his lesson, which I totally guarantee he does not. Unlike the runaway elephant, this episode doesn't have any action, any humor, or anything that I could call interesting. I do, however, love the scene where Duncan was almost falling off the bridge and he looked very scared. I could definitely feel the tension and the stress building up on me during that scene, and the music certainly did help make that scene a very stressful sight to behold. But even with that scene, I'm still gonna have to call this episode weak. I honestly wanted to give this episode a good rating, because Duncan has the most interesting episodes out of any of the narrow gauge engines in my opinion. But this episode is the same simple Duncan plot we've seen before, and it's getting quite tiring to see it again, so therefore I give it a weak episode rating. I do understand where Toy Bonnie and others are coming from with this episode, but I can't help but to enjoy this episode. It's a guilty pleasure of mine because this is one of the season 7 episodes I watched a lot of as a kid, and it's because of the bridge scene. I knew that as a kid that Duncan was going to be saved. But this episode, as Toy Barney mentions, does a good job playing up the suspense of Duncan about to fall into the water and Rusty coming to his rescue. It reminds me of Toby and the Flood with how the scene was shot and edited. The music also helps with the suspense and rescue scene that even today I can't help but to still like this episode. Also, this is one of the rare times the driver is also at fault for the accident in this episode, not just the engine itself. Now, if you find this episode boring because of the repeat plot, then I don't blame you. But to me, this episode is still memorable that I'm giving it a 7 out of 10 for a good episode. Episode 182, Three Cheers for Thomas. Thomas is asked to help out a sports day after Sir Topham Hatt had left the boxes of medals in his office. Alright, so here we are, the final episode of the classic era of Thomas. Was this episode a good way to end the era? Yes. Yes it was. This episode does show what Thomas was from the start. A fun show with simple but memorable characters, a simple but fun story, and just something enjoyable to watch whenever. So after six long seasons, we finally get to see Thomas and Birdie racing again, and it's a fun race. Maybe not as good as the first race, but it's nice to be reminded of why that race was good to begin with. Now I do prefer the US version in terms of the racing music because that's what I heard as a kid, and I still think it fits. But at the same time, I give props to Mike and Junior for remixing the Let's Have a Race song and use it for this episode. I actually didn't catch it at first until Toy Barney told me and we watched this episode again. Also again, I like the fact that we get to see Thomas maturing. Instead of ignoring Sir Topham Hatt and finishing the race, he goes back and helps out. I say he does deserve a medal for his hard work. And so does this episode for doing a good job of closing off not only Season 7, but the classical era and as such, I'm giving this episode a 10 out of 10 for a great episode. The grand finale has arrived. And if my memory is correct, this was my very first Thomas episode back in 2005. And I absolutely still adore this episode 17 years later. I love everything in this episode. Thomas and Birdie raising each other for the first time since Thomas and Birdie all the way back in Season 1. I love Thomas helping out Sir Topham Hatt pick up the medals after he accidentally loved them in his office. And I just love every single second of this episode. This episode is a great way to say goodbye to the classic era of Thomas. And it's also a great way to celebrate Thomas as a whole with all the stock footage this episode had. 
There really isn't that much to say other than three cheers for this episode being a fantastic episode. Hip hip hooray! And that is every episode of Season 7 Reviewed. Now how did the final season of the classic series do in terms of episodes? Well according to my pie chart right here, Season 7 had 21 good episodes, 4 weak episodes and 1 failway episode. That is actually not bad. I was expecting this season to have lots of weak episodes, but no, apparently the episodes are still just as good as I first remembered them to be. So now let's see how Sokoa's chart stacked up. Well on my end for season 7, I've counted 22 good episodes, 3 meh episodes, and 1 bad episode. I must say that this chart also caught me off guard a bit. I was ready to expect more meh episodes from this season, and while not all the good episodes were solid, these were my honest opinions about all the episodes and how I truly felt about them. Much like Season 6, most of these episodes were simple, and some of them were just memorable enough that I couldn't think of too many bad things to say about them. And now onto our top 5 episodes from Season 7. Here's my list. Number 5, Edward's Brass Band. Again, we could argue as to whether Edward is out of character or not in this episode, but for me, I think this episode is a great episode with a great story and some nice visuals to go along with it. Number 4, Harold on the Flying Horse. I love the story concept in this episode on how it's always important to stay on duty even if you're feeling left out. Plus, the camera work in this episode was so superb that I just had to add this episode to the list. Number 3, The Refreshment Ladies Tea Shop. I was originally gonna give this spot to the grand opening, but this sequel to Peter Sam and the Refreshment Lady is just a perfect episode on its own that I think it deserves to be on this list. Number 2, Best Dressed Engine. Now this was tough to put at number 2 because this and my number 1 pick could change tomorrow. Tomorrow this could be my favorite Season 7 episode, but as of now, I think this episode is a very close second to my number 1 pick because I love everything in this episode. The story, the visuals, the music, Gordon running with the banner on his face, and so on. And number one, three cheers for Thomas. This episode is the perfect grand finale for the classic era of the show. I love this episode from beginning to end. The race between Thomas and Birdie was an epic addition to this finale. And Thomas getting that medal at the end for helping out on the sports day alone catapults this episode to the top of the list. Now, like I said, number two and number one could change tomorrow. But as of now, this is my favorite season seven episode. Alright, now let's move the camera over to Sakoa so he can share his top 5 Season 7 episodes with us. Alright, well here are my top 5 episodes for this season. Number 5, Not So Hasty Pudding. Honestly, after thinking long and hard about this, this episode wins me over with this great visuals and character interaction between Thomas and Elizabeth. Number 4, James and the Queen of Sodor. This episode gives you plenty of surprises that the jokes and the ending still holds up really well in this episode. Number 3, What's the Matter with Henry? It was between this and the old Iron Bridge, but I picked this one because it does a good job on how ignoring someone's illness can lead to actual danger. And I love Emily in this episode in showing that all it takes is for one person to speak up, and it can make a good difference. Number 2, The Refreshment Ladies Tea Shop. I was this close, I'm putting this in a number 1, and Honestly, I still consider this my favorite episode with the visuals and simple storytelling, but after thinking about it, while this is my favorite episode, there's another episode that also does a good job on capturing this show. And number one, three cheers for Thomas. Toy Barney pretty much summed up my thoughts on this episode in that it was a great way to end off the classic era, and again, remind all of us on why we were fans of the show in the first place when it first aired. Now let's talk about the directing for this season, and oh boy, does this season have an interesting directing style. Now you can see that the transition from the classic era and the new era is shown a little bit in this season. There are some moments where the sets and the models look as if they had a huge upgrade, and once again, the different sets and new models for this season looks really good. I think the season really does shine the best in terms of directing. The looks on the new engines are spectacular. It does feel like Minden and his crew wanted to have a good send-off for the next director. Now in terms of editing, oh boy. Now, it's nothing new for the show to have stock footage, but for season 7, it is really noticeable. Now, from what I've heard, this season had a tight budget because they were also working on the Jack in the Pack spin-off, along with this season. So I guess I could see why they needed some stock footage, but at the same time, you'd think they would have checked the episodes back and fixed some of the noticeable parts, like Peter Sam having his old funnel, or Thomas delivering a Christmas tree, even though he was never delivering a Christmas tree to begin with. 
But honestly, I guess it's not that bad. It's just really distracting. But it doesn't ruin any of the episodes. So overall, I say the directing was solid for this season. Now let's see what Toy Barney thinks of the directing. Well, you pretty much nailed what I was going to say. These sets look absolutely astonishing and very well made. It makes me feel like now I truly am in a railway with all these engines. Season 7 for me features some of the best camera work I've ever seen in this series, and it's definitely a huge step up from the camera work in Season 6. Now I'll admit that the use of stock footage does get a little bit repetitive, and very odd at times. But like Sakoa, I really don't mind it because to me the stock footage makes me nostalgic at times and seeing them for one last time before we move on to a brand new era for the show makes me want to go back and watch those episodes over and over again. The models in this season were amazing and all of them looked beautiful and you can tell that the team really wanted them to look their best to close off this era of the show. And that's why I'm giving the team two thumbs up for this. Overall, Season 7 has quite possibly one of the best visuals out of any season in the classic era next to seasons 2, 4, and 5. Good job David Minnan and may you rest in peace. So now that we talked about the directing, let's get into the music. Before I talk about my opinions on the music for this season, I'll be sharing my top 3 music videos for this season. I forgot to talk about Mike and Junior's music during our previous collaboration in season 5, so I'll be doing that in this video. So anyways, here we go. Number 3, The Whistle Song. Quite possibly one of the best songs dedicated to something the engines use. It's catchy, it's memorable, and I love all the little different close-ups of the engines' whistles. Number 2, Salty. One of the rarest music videos of the classic era, but even with that, this song never gets old for me. I love the instrumentation and I love the lyrics of this song. It truly defies who Salty really is. And number 1, The Red Balloon. Along with That's What Friends Are For, this is one of my favorite Thomas songs of all time. It was my very first music video when I was a kid, and I can't believe that 16 years later, it remains one of my all-time favorite Thomas songs. I love how Mike and Junior use synthesizers to make it feel like an orchestra is playing the Red Balloons theme, the children singing is just beautiful, the music video is amazing, and literally everything about this song shines. Mike and Junior, you've done it again. Great job. Speaking of them, now let's talk about how they did in terms of the soundtrack for this season and for the last time because this was their last season before both departed the show due to a contractual dispute would hit. Honestly, their soundtrack for this season was very mids for me. There were some episodes where I felt their music just didn't suit well with some of the episodes, mainly because I grew up with Robert Harshorn's soundtrack aka the US version. However, on the episodes that their soundtrack works, it works absolutely well. They used modern instruments to make the soundtrack feel more modern, and they also took some of the characters' already existing themes and completely remixed them to make them fit with the times. That was a very smart choice on my end, though I am not really a big fan of Thomas and Season 7 theme, I felt that they completely made it a little too modern, but that's just me. Overall, I think both did a good job with their final season, and while I didn't like some of their music in some episodes, I still think they redeemed themselves with the music videos for this season. So farewell Mike and Junior, your work on the show will never be forgotten. Now as for Robert Harshorn's music, well, he did a very good job as well. Now I'm gonna take this season as his music test before he takes over the music in the next season. His music for the episodes brought more energy to the episodes like the scene where Duncan almost fell off the wooden bridge was one of his highlights for me. He completely made the scene very stressful and makes you wish that Duncan is rescued in time. Other highlights include Best Dressed Engine, Something Fishy, The Runaway Elephant, Snow Engine, Renee is on the Roller Coaster, the list goes on. Overall, Hartshorn passed the test with me and his music definitely helped some of the episodes become a little bit more interesting to watch. So welcome to the team, Robert. Anyway, before we move on to the big one, let's see what Sekoa has to say about the music for this season. Alright. Well, before I talk about Mike and Junior, I'm going to talk about Robert first. Because his soundtrack for Season 7 is what I grew up with. In fact, outside of a couple of episodes where the UK soundtrack was used, I've only just now listened to Mike and Junior's soundtrack for the first time while reviewing this season. So I thought it would be fair if I were to save them for last. So anyway, as Toy Barney mentioned, Robert did a good job making new soundtracks for this season, and his style is just as memorable as Mike and Junior's. Was it always better? No, there were a couple of episodes like Bulgy Rides Again, Not So Hasty Puddings, Emily's New Coaches, and so on where I prefer Mike and Junior's music over Robert's. 
But at the same time, there's a couple of episodes, mostly those that have the runaway scenes like Best Dress Engine, The Runaway Elephant, and Renee is in a roller coaster where he does a better job setting up the fast pace in those scenes. And there's other episodes like Percy Gets It Right, Three Cheers for Thomas, and Trusty Rusty, where he also shows off his skills and it pays off really well. Now, it's been a long time since I've seen any episodes from seasons 8 to 12, so I can't say for sure if he was always this good, but I will say, for his first season, he does really well, and I think he started off strong with this season. Now, what about Mike and Junior? Was this season their best work, and was it a good way for them to retire? I can safely say that their work for this season is still good. I can say these two stepped up their game for this season compared to the last season. Their new soundtrack for Engines Like Emily was very good, and the remix for some of the Engines themes like Henry was just as good. Now like I said, there were some episodes where I felt the US soundtrack worked better, and there were some soundtracks like Duncan's new theme and their use of the William Overturn theme was okay. No disrespect to them, and again, when their music works, it works so well. Now that's no difference when it comes to their music videos. With the exception of one song that was okay, the rest of the songs are still catchy, upbeat, and a joy to listen to. For my top 3 picks for this season, I would go for There Once Was An Engine Who Ran Away, because I've listened to the song a lot as a kid, and it's still stuck in my head with the instruments and lyrics. Troublesome Trucks for the upbeat and almost cartoony little track, which fits perfectly within their characters. And I would also have to put the red balloon at the top too, for a very gentle and relaxing song that makes you want to ride in a hot air balloon itself. Overall, Mike and Junior are still masters when it comes to the soundtrack for Thomas. But if I'm also being honest, I think it's safe to say they were running out of ideas for new pieces at this point. So it's not hard to imagine why Hit felt it was time for someone else to try their hand in making music for Thomas. And they picked a good follower for Mike and Junior. And hopefully within the next few seasons, Robert Hartstone will be just as good as Mike and Junior. And now, the moment... Okay, we're just talking about the narrators. You guys know how this works by now. And since we've got a new narrator for the US, and he'll be sticking around for a long time, let's go ahead and talk about Michael Brandon first. Now, for those that don't know, when Michael Brandon first started off as a narrator for the show, a lot of Thomas fans hated him. Some, in my opinion, probably hated him too much. He was definitely not a popular narrator when he stayed on the show, and at first I didn't understand why as a kid. So I'm going to say this right now, I don't think Brandon was as bad as a lot of Thomas fans make him out to be. Now remember, I started watching Thomas around the time seasons 5 and 6 were still new seasons at that time, and I did have a couple of seasons 7 and 8 VHS and DVDs that featured his narration, and I didn't think he was that bad. And after reading his interview he did for the Sodor Island fan site, he sounds like a really nice guy. I think it's safe to say that after his retirement from season 16, some people have been giving him a little bit more slack. Anyway, after watching the US version of season 7, is Brandon still a good narrator? To me, I think he's still fine. Now I will admit, maybe he wasn't as good as I remembered him to be. And watching the episodes again, I was also reminded that there were times where I can see some people saying his narration can get annoying. Now, to be fair, it's not like other narrators like Ringo, Angelus, Baldwin, or hell, even Carlin was above criticism when it came to their narration skills. And one of Brandon's main flaws when it comes to his narration is that he'll give the engines three kinds of voices. The normal voice, the gruff voice, or the nasally voice. For some engines like Thomas, Diesel, and Duncan, his narration is not that bad, and he does put in the effort. But for others like Reneus, his voice and the over-the-top exaggerations he gives can't get on some people's nerves. So is Brandon the best narrator in the show? Well to be fair, he's good, and I think his narration does make some episodes enjoyable to watch. But at the same time, I do get some of the criticism he gets from others for being a bit over-the-top and yeah, at times it is distracting, but hey, at least he tries, and putting some effort is better than putting no effort at all. So, for this season, Brandon gets a good rating for me. What about you, Toy Bonnie? What do you think about Michael Brandon? Well, Mr. Michael Brandon, this is probably gonna piss some Brandon haters off, but I don't give a fuck, because I love his narration. If you guys watched my Season 3 review, I stated that he along with George Carlin were my favorite narrators of the show, 
and I still feel that way. Brandon was my narrator while I was growing up, and I really don't mind his character voices too much. Sure, looking back as an adult, there are some parts where I feel he could have gone back into the studio and re-recorded them, but as it stands, I still think he did a fantastic job with Season 7. He brought back a lot of energy to the narrator position, which was definitely needed after Baldwin's terrible Season 6 narration. And since he had watched the show with his son Alex for many years before becoming the narrator, I think Brandon was the right choice for the job. So with all that said, Brandon for me is the perfect replacement for Baldwin, and let's hope he keeps up that great narration and character voices for the next 5 seasons. Now Sir Michael Angelis, uh, oh boy, let me talk about him real quick. This is the season where I can feel that his narration was slowly starting to become very weak. There were some episodes where I would almost literally snooze off because I couldn't get over his boring narration. But on the other hand, there were episodes like Gordon and Spencer and James and the Queen of Sodor where I think he did a fantastic job in both narrating and performing the characters' as voices. By the way, I love his James voice a lot. Anyways, Angelus' narration has sadly started to decline during this season which is not a good sign for what's to come. But when it comes to Season 7 only, I think he did an okay job with this season. Now let's see what Sakoa thinks about Mr. Angelus. Alright, so last season I gave Angelus a good review, and for this season he did another solid job with his narration. Honestly, I'm starting to understand why a lot of fans from the UK like his narration. And fun fact, before Brandon got the job narrating for Thomas in the US, Angela stepped in and recorded four Season 7 episodes for the US on a VHS release. Anyway, there were some episodes where his narration does change a bit, and while I'm still not used to James's voice, if he's not shouting out his lines, I've grown to like it over time. His other voices like Duncan, Diesel, and of course Sir Topham Hat are still good, and his voice for the new engines like Spencer and Arthur are good as well. I don't have too much to say about him, but overall he did a fine job for this season. So, was Season 7 a good way to end off the classic era of Thomas and Friends? Well, I must say, first off, that I was a little surprised with how much this season has surprised me. Like I said from the beginning, I wasn't that fond of Season 7 when it first came out, and I thought it was going to be like Season 3 where it had some good episodes, but it wasn't good enough and I was ready to give it a met rating. However, after watching all these episodes three times, I must say I was impressed with how well these episodes were upon watching. Were all of them that good? No, and I'll be honest, even though I was surprised with the outcome of Season 7, I also remember why I didn't enjoy it at first as a kid. And it's not just because the stories are simple, but I guess you could say that they're too simple, and at times a little predictable too. There were some moments where I felt the episodes were either rushed or just felt one-noted at times, that I had no reason to watch them again. But at the same time, they weren't horrible. They were well put together, and the purpose of Thomas back then was to tell simple slice-of-life stories, and some of these episodes did a good job of that. I was impressed with the directing, the editing, and the music from this season, too. And while there were moments where some characters might have felt out of place or out of character, it didn't completely ruin my whole experience with this season, and I could tell a lot of effort was put into this season as a final farewell for the old generation that stuck with Thomas, and now they're ready to welcome a new generation with new stories, new characters, and a new team to work on it. And Season 7 was a good way to transition into the new era. So as such, I have to be honest and say I was wrong with this season. And I'm glad that this season proved me wrong. And I'll go ahead and give it a 7 out of 10 for a good season. While it's still not my most favorite season of the classic era, I think this season was a bit better than what I remembered it. And when it worked, it worked so well. And now I feel like I'm ready to enter a new era and see if there were other seasons I thought were terrible, but maybe they were actually decent or even better than I'm giving them credit. Alright Toy Barney, take it away with your final thoughts. There are a lot of reasons why I can say that Season 7 is my favorite season of the Classic Era, but I'll keep my final thoughts short. This season to me is the most nostalgic Thomas season ever. I love everything about this season from the sets, to the characters, to the visuals, oh I can go on. I can safely tell you that this season is the perfect farewell to the classic era of Thomas, and while I feel that the writing got a little bit of a downgrade, it didn't really bother me at all. Well, except for that episode. Overall, if you hate the new era of Thomas and you just want to enjoy some classic Thomas from here on out, definitely check out Season 7. It's got some good episodes, great music videos, and some good narration to go along with it. So with all the positives said, I have no shame in saying that this is definitely a good season. I do feel 
feel the season 7 could have been a bit better with some good writers like Britt and David, but as it stands, it's a wonderful and memorable ending to an era of Thomas that us fans will never forget for the rest of our lives. Well, we did it. It's been, wow, six years since I've started reviewing every season of Thomas, and now we've done it. We reviewed all seven seasons of the classic era. Well, you have done an excellent job, my good friend. It was this little blue bastard with the face that brought us together in the first place. So what do you say if you let the people know what's coming up next for your Thomas reviews? Well, we know that I'm going to be doing a hit era of Thomas. I know a couple of people are going to be asking about that to begin with. Me too. I was thinking I will join you from now on when it comes to Thomas stuff. Well, that's nice and all, but I don't want people to jump on you for being on my channel too much. Not a problem. I rented a little room in the YouTube space. What do you mean? A new channel. I made a new channel dedicated to both you and me. Don't you remember the plane crazy review we did while we were working on this review? You mean that wasn't a nightmare I had a few months ago? Aw, oh, come on. I think this will be great for the both of us. We like to review movies and shows together, not just Thomas, and we've learned from each other since the start of our friendship. This channel will be great for us to use whenever we want to review something together. Unless, of course, you don't mind me breaking into your channel every two weeks and convincing you to review something with me. Uh, on second thought, I think a co-op channel is necessary. Um, so, what does it look like? Well, why don't you come over and I'll show you. And for you viewers watching that also want to check out our new channel, click the link in the description box to check it out.